Good afternoon. My name is Brian Carey, VP of Marketing here at Unbound Medicine. Thank you for joining us today as we present to you a series of short webinars titled COVID-19, Are We Getting Ahead? Today, we will be discussing the latest in therapeutics and prevention. This pre-recorded presentation will last about 15 minutes. Please feel free to chat in the window provided and ask questions from fellow listeners. The recorded webinar will be shared with everyone via email and uploaded to Unbound Medicine's YouTube channel. Now, please let me introduce our presenter, Dr. Paul Alwater. Dr. Alwater is the Sherilyn and Ken Fisher Professor of Medicine at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, serving as the clinical director for the Division of Infectious Diseases and director of the Center for Environmental Infectious Diseases. He serves as the executive director of the Johns Hopkins Point of Care Information Technology Center. And in 2018, he served as the president for the Infectious Diseases Society of America, the largest professional society worldwide related to infectious diseases. At this time, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Alwater. Thank you, Brian. Uh, welcome to another segment uh, of COVID-19, Are We Getting Ahead? Uh, I'm Paul Auerter, and uh, we're going to focus today on some uh, therapeutics. Uh, this is uh, something which I think will certainly evolve over time. I'm recording this on April 16th, so please take that into consideration if you're listening at a much later date. There are many approaches now for uh, understanding uh, investigational and or therapeutic approaches for interrupting the virus at a uh, antiviral uh, level, anywhere starting from antibodies that would inhibit binding or other molecules uh, to protease inhibitors uh, such as uh, lopinavir, ritonavir, which uh, could uh, potentially uh, affect a polypeptide chain formation to a more traditional nucleoside analog such as remdesivir to interrupt RNA synthesis or I'm um, sure as uh, many of you know in the press there's been a lot of uh, discussion about the anti-malarials chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. So uh, the uh, Avenues to intervene also include immunomodulatory actions, which aren't depicted on here, but for the virus in certain people that it provokes an intense cytokine cascade, uh, patients are very ill in the ICU with an ARDS picture, affords another uh, avenue that is also being explored. I'll mention that um, a traditional look at trying to develop recommendations was recently released as a living guideline by the Infectious Disease Society of America. And there were seven recommendations, which I can give you in quite shorthand, is that any of the uh, drugs used, uh, with the exception of steroids, were considered to have a knowledge gap and for use only within context of a clinical trial. The exception uh, was corticosteroids, uh, which they um, suggested uh, should not be used with very low certainty of evidence for COVID-19 pneumonia. We know with influenza and other viral diseases, steroid use generally is not helpful and even leads to more poor outcomes. Now, uh, the fact that this is a knowledge gap and their recommendations I don't think are surprising and reflects one pole of an approach with a brand new disease that's so widespread and really without uh, information that's available. Uh, many have argued in Ebola and other diseases that the only ethical approach is a clinical trial uh, because we do not know the harms of these approaches and the benefits are only theoretical. On the other hand, uh, we have so little knowledge, we have patients in front of us, often without any availability to offer them clinical trials. And so what do you do in this context? And so therefore patient, uh, 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 prescribers and patients have both um, uh, looked to uh, drugs that have been popularized um, uh, in the media often and discussed quite frequently. So we'll, we'll just touch on those. Uh, the, 
the antivirals, uh, importantly, the hydroxychloroquine, which has been the main drug in the United States with availability, or its cousin chloroquine as antimalarials have been uh, advocated as having impact for COVID-19, pneumonia, or a disease. What I'll mention is that the basis for this really is in vitro uh, studies where these drugs um, seem to uh, uh, decrease uh, viral uh, effects and viral reproduction within host cells. Now, I'll mention that almost any drug that uh, impacts protein synthesis or MR mRNA or RNA uh, a generation in the test tube will lower viral production. And the, the trick though is you want those drugs to work in vivo. The problem is we see this so frequently in test tubes that it doesn't really translate once uh, people take it. And it's important to note that although these drugs do uh, thought to impact the phagolysosome and acidification, in cells, when trials have been done with this drug for influenza or Ebola, they failed. Uh, for HIV, it actually raised uh, the viral load. And so basically, th these drugs have never been shown uh, in humans to ever have an impact on a viral illness. So if this happens for um, COVID-19, it would be a first. In terms of these drugs, I've put uh, information that I'm aware of uh, here in a table. I thought I would just make a few mentions here. First, these are all preprints, not peer review, and are very small uh, trials and quite limited. Uh, uh, the one that sort of kicked this off really isn't listed here, and that is the Chinese guidelines really set the template for what I think many people considered using here, which was chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, along with Chinese traditional medications, uh, tocilizumab, uh, uh, lipinavir, ritonavir as part of the recommendations. Now, there's no uh, data to back this. For example, the chloroquine was first mentioned just in one paper by Gao that said it helped uh, inhibit pneumonia and decrease duration of illness. That report has not yet been published and it was only two sentences. So we really don't know the basis. There have been two randomized controlled trials uh, out of China. Jay Chen looked at it in 30 patients and really found no difference between controls and those who received hydroxychloroquine. So the thought was that if the drug has an effect, it is not uh, robust and will need a much larger trial. Z Chen looked in a larger group and said uh, that there was a reduction in fever of those who got hydroxychloroquine and some improvement in imaging, but it's notable to say that these antimalarials are well known as antipyretics. So the fact that fever is decreased, uh, I think is not something that um, is probably uh, a good endpoint to choose. Two French studies have gotten a large amount of press that were both uncontrolled trials, uh, looking at hydroxychloroquine or that drug with azithromycin. And uh, the first uh, row by Gao Trey got all the press because they said the combination more significantly reduced viral shedding in six patients, but there is no clinical outcome. And then the group looked at a larger number of patients, although they really were not uh, with severe disease, and said that 80% had a negative PCR by day eight, but again, no comparator arm. A different French group pushed back. They looked at this drug combination in a more ill population. They still found positive um, uh, molecular uh, RNA uh, at days five and six, but they also reported on one death and one prolonged QT uh, and felt that this uh, was a, a danger signal. And uh, most recently, a Brazil group um, under the auspices of a randomized uh, trial looked at high and lower dose chloroquine and actually stopped the, the trial prematurely because of a lethality trend in the higher dose chloroquine. Um, and uh, so I think these are all important provisos. The French um, have looked, uh, do routine pharmacovigilance and have noted in the past uh, three weeks that of 53 cardiac adverse events, uh, the vast majority were due to uh, uh, patients receiving either hydroxychloroquine or uh, that plus azithromycin. Uh, they saw seven 
cases of cardiac death, uh, 12 syncope, and the other with prolonged QT. So again, another warning sign on this uh, combination. In fact, here at our hospital, um, these drugs, if they're employed, are stopped uh, if patients are ill enough to go to the intensive care unit. Uh, remdesivir, as I mentioned, uh, is, had often been heralded as the most promising antiviral. Um, it was developed originally for Ebola, but uh, monoclonal antibodies did better. Uh, and the drug seemed to protect primates against MERS-CoV or uh, treat them if they were given the drug soon after experimental infection. We still don't have widespread data available, but uh, studies have been expanded uh, here in the United States, two of them, which might reflect that there hasn't been great impact. Uh, this is an intravenous drug, and I do worry that um, this is a drug that might be given too late in illness to really be effective by the time patients are ill enough to be in hospital. Uh, this paper in the New England Journal got a fair amount of press recently on the compassionate use experience. Um, uh, and 61 patients were in this trial. Um, I don't think much can be taken from it, although 68% said to have improved oxygenation. Again, there was no comparator arms. And so uh, many people have said this looks as a success, but we, we really don't know although um, people have pointed out that high numbers required mechanical ventilation. Lastly, I'll touch on the later phase of illness that uh, has intense cytokine um, aspects to it. And uh, there was a lot of uh, focus upon tocilizumab. Uh, this is an interleukin-6 receptor blocker. And uh, this drug uh, is approved for example, rheumatoid arthritis. I think the reason it's gotten a lot of attention is it is FDA approved for uh, CAR T cell cytokine release syndrome, which has uh, a, a, probably a greater severity than what we're seeing in COVID-19, but a lot of similarities in terms of a cytokine profiles where people, uh, patients who are so affected of really intense elevations in inflammatory markers like CRP, ferritin, uh, have positive D-dimers, and elevated interleukin-6 levels. So um, there's still not very much data on these types of drugs, still unpublished studies that suggest that people have had benefit. But um, compared to hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, I'd say there's much more sense in the centers that have used this drug anecdotally that this drug does have a near immediate impact that's hard to say would just be the natural history of recovery of the virus where people have rapid abatement in uh, fever and improvement in respiratory symptoms. For example, a colleague uh, in Hong Kong uh, sent these uh, x-rays where on the right-hand side, uh, someone had COVID pneumonia. And then the next day on the left, you can see uh, the res uh, had a great clinical response after receiving tocilizumab. So um, uh, these are the sorts of stories that I think continue to drive consideration for these patients. Um, patients, I think, get it late into their illness, may not have much benefit, um, but uh, many um, centers are trying to figure out how this drug might be used before we have clinical trial data and um, are often targeting patients who are on the verge of going to the ICU or requiring intubation or soon thereafter. Lastly, uh, there's been a lot of uh, hope that convalescent plasma might offer some benefits, um, not only for prophylaxis, but for disease treatment. Uh, there are uh, uh, trials uh, underway soon here in the US. Uh, the FDA did uh, approve an emergency investigational new drug application that anyone can apply for. Uh, if they have severe COVID-19 disease. Um, the, the, the kicker here is that the FDA, of course, does not supply the plasma. Uh, the physician must find their own supply and then uh, submit for uh, receipt of this drug. So I'd like to close with a few notes about prevention. Of course, this is the way to really curtail or perhaps even end the pandemic uh, faster than it would on its own accord. Uh, 
This slide, although busy, was recently published by modelers trying to look at some scenarios uh, based on how immunity develops. And of course, this assumes we don't have an effective uh, treatment. It also makes assumptions that we don't have a vaccine or uh, perhaps uh, the role of social distancing. But you can get the sense that if you have very good long-term immunity, such as in D, this would be fantastic. And indeed, probably the viral uh, illness would really die out. However, if there's shorter term immunity or, or even seasonal variation, you would tend to see peaks of the virus is, uh, in the gray here. And by contrast, you see uh, the red and the blue are uh, uh, regular corona respiratory viruses that uh, always circulate to give you some sense of how they might behave. We know from those coronaviruses that immunity tends not to be very good or durable and certainly not cross-protective. So uh, these are some aspects that um, I think we still don't know and we don't know, excuse me, we don't know yet if the seasonal variation uh, would occur with this respiratory virus, although uh, we know there are certainly cases in the Southern Hemisphere now which is uh, their summer or uh, fall. Um, in terms of vaccine development, I wanted to end on some good news. Uh, uh, there have been a large number of different approaches to developing vaccines, uh, many of which are already in preclinical development and a few that have even gone into phase one. I think this is uh, promising. The WHO has estimated 12 to 18 months in order to take um, uh, appropriate measures for determining efficacy and safety uh, for a virus. Uh, there are ways that this might be shortened perhaps, including uh, human challenge virus uh, uh, models. So um, I think everyone's looking for ways to get tools uh, that are safe and effective as fast as possible. Uh, this would be a wonderful complement, of course, and uh, close relatives, meaning monoclonal specific antibodies or, or convalescent plasma could be other methods uh, that we might employ uh, if uh, appearing safe before uh, we have an effective vaccine. So again, I wanted to thank you for listening to this segment. Uh, you may want to explore others of interest to you. Uh, and if you have questions about the Johns Hopkins uh, ABX guide, uh, feel free to visit the website or email, uh, which are shown here. I want to thank everybody who um, is uh, working so hard during this very difficult time. Please stay safe and stay well, and thanks for listening. Thank you, Dr. Alwater, and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. For more information about the Hopkins Guides, visit hopkinsguides.com. Also, We've opened all of the topics related to COVID-19 on the site, so that can be referenced from anyone from any computer worldwide. If you have any questions about anything about the guides or about this webinar, please contact sales at unboundmedicine.com. Thank you so much, stay safe, and have a great day.